This is a Chris knife from the movie Dune, and I'm gonna turn it into bronze. In the movie, they make a big deal out of these special swords they fight with. They're sacred, and even dying holding one is a great honor. This Chris knife was given to me by my great aunt. This will be a great honor for you to die holding it. In the movie, the knife was made from a tooth from a sandworm. The largest and most dangerous organism on Arrakis is the sandworm, capable of reaching 400 meters in length. Since we don't have sandworms on this planet, I 3D printed mine. Now we're going to take the 3D print and turn it into bronze. The print turned out okay, but it'll still take a little prep work before we can cast it. The supports, which really weren't holding anything to begin with, need to come off, and all the points that they contacted need to be sanded away and smoothed out. There were even supports printed on the inlet where the sword is supposed to plug into. I guess that's important and necessary, but it's still annoying. Mainly because they're such a pain to remove. It's still going to take a bit of filing and shaping to get this to fit properly. And hopefully I can make it through this project without cutting my thumb off. In the end I just use a file to shape it to the right size. To smooth out the layer lines I just use some sandpaper and that works pretty well. And then I just hot glued it together. The cutting edge of the blade was so thin it didn't really print as smooth as I'd like. So I took some wood putty epoxy and I filled the edge in. And then I smoothed it and sanded it and yada yada. You know how that goes. Let's move on to the fun stuff. I'll prep some oil based sand and move on to the sand casting. I'm going to begin by making a false cope. It's a bed of sand that's packed firm but not too hard. Just enough so I can press the sword in there and it'll cradle the blade without misshaping it. This powdered limestone will serve to separate the next layer of sand. This next layer will become the drag and I'll pack it very tightly and it will be used in the final mold. The red sand is unused petrobond. It gives a nice good finishing layer. The darker sand is older recycled petrobond. The whole thing is flipped over, I take the top layer off, and then I start the process again. The false cope is destroyed because that was there just to cradle the blade. Now on the next layer I can pack it firm the way it should be and that'll help me capture a better quality surface finish. Now I need to remove the print and carve in the gates and runners for the metal to flow into. The fattest part of this piece is kind of in the middle at the handle so I'm going to try to carve a reservoir that will hold a pool of molten metal so when it shrinks it can draw from that. Once that's all finished it's time to put both halves back together and we're ready for the casting. So the mold is made, it looks good, except all of this lettering pulled out of the sand. I expected that it would. But now the question is, what kind of metal would a blade like this look good in? Tin bronze, silicon bronze, aluminum bronze, Nordic gold. I'm just gonna melt down this bronze sword that didn't turn out before. Tin bronze it is. I'm gonna just put the whole sword in there all at once. You might think, why not cut it into pieces? It'll melt way faster that way. Eh, it'll melt eventually, and it did, so now it's time to pour it. Houston, we have a problem. Unfortunately, the metal didn't flow to the tip of the blade. I'm sure many out there saw it coming and know exactly what I did wrong, so feel free to let me know in the comments. In the meantime, I gotta redo this. It was going real good until right about there. Up until this, this area right here. I'd never get it right the first try. Okay, let's do it again. Take two. I just happen to have another failed bronze sword to try again with. So once again, I'll make a false cope. At least I got a head start on this one. I'm going to do the exact same process and hope for a different result. 
It cast well around the handle in the first part of the blade, so I'm going to do everything the same. The only part that's going to be different is I'm going to try to pour the metal a little bit faster to hopefully force it into the tip of the blade. It's a long way for the metal to travel, and it cools so fast. I gotta say, melting these old bronze swords is kind of fun. How often you get to play with a metal sword that feels like rubber. Once it's melted, it's time to try again. Now this flask is tipped at a steeper angle and I'm going to pour the metal faster. Whoops, too fast. How did I do worse a second time? Think you can win on talent alone? You don't have enough talent to win on talent alone. Again. So I'll do it again, but with a new method. So the key to getting this is going to be to get a lot of metal in really fast. The blade is so thin, the metal's just freezing before it gets to the tip. So I think what I'll try now, vertical pour, but I don't like when the metal goes in the same way the air goes out because there's so much turbulence. So I'm going to try to make a runner that goes alongside and enters in several points up the blade and up the handle and hopefully I can get enough metal in there fast enough before it freezes. The vertical pour should help with speed and it'll also add hydrostatic pressure to force the metal into the small places. Another failure, but, but this tells an amazing story of the metal. Just too much distance for the metal to come. See, the first one froze right away. It's so thin, not surprising. But when the metal rose to this point and in, that's where it gets really interesting. You can see where the metal came down and puddled around here. You can see the turbulence. You can see the difference in the casting. And then as soon as you get above that entry point, you get that laminar flow and it's smooth, no flaws. And as it travels up, you can see the metal cooling and you start getting lap lines. So it shows turbulence, laminar flow, and lap lining, all in a little area like that. Even in failure, lessons can be learned. Don't be afraid to fail. Every failure teaches you something. Still don't know how to get this darn casting to work. <sighs> We've been going about this all wrong. I blame myself. We need a whole new technology. It's time for resin casting. Resin casting will give you a higher quality print, but there's some interesting things you can do with it if you use the right resin. So sand casting is just not working. So what I've done now is I've printed it in castable resin. With this resin, I can use the lost wax casting method. I set it in investment, and then I burn the resin out and fill the void with bronze. Still needs a little prep work though. There really isn't much to clean up. It's mainly where the supports intersect the piece. It leaves little pock marks that I need to cut away or smooth out. It's a pretty good fit. I'll use some wax to fill in that gap, but other than that, that's all I'll have to do. The next problem is it's too big for my curing station. So I'm going to have to improvise. I need something that'll produce lots of ultraviolet light. Tanning starts now. And of course, rule number two is break the rules. It is impossible to be a maverick or a true original if you're too well behaved and don't want to break the rules. I don't know if there's actually a rule against using a tanning bed to cure a resin print, but it sure worked well. Okay, now I'm going to add the wax sprues. So I bought this pipe to put the sword in. Cost nine bucks, but it doesn't fit in my kiln. So I gotta cut it down. I'm gonna need to make this pipe as long as I can to fit the sword in and still have enough clearance of investment on both sides. So that's the maximum height that can have this pipe and I'm hoping it's long enough for the sword. So the hot glue is that color because I left my hot glue gun on for probably four days. <laughs> okay. 
The investment is a specific type of plaster designed for casting and able to take the high temperatures. Now one thing I forgot to account for is how much metal expands when it gets really hot. The pipe expanded so much it started to lift the lid open on my kiln. Regardless, we'll get the metal melted and on this one, I got high hopes. I pull a flask out of the kiln while it's still hot and that should give the metal a lot more time to get into the small spaces of the blade before it freezes. I attempted to hold the torch on the top plug of metal, hoping that it would keep it molten so when that bigger metal handle shrunk, it would have a reservoir to draw from. I was a little late in grabbing the torch though. And this long pipe was way too big for the bucket, so it was kind of a pain to quench. A proper quench should dissolve all the investment away, but since I cooled the sides of the flask before the water got to the investment, it just solidified without falling apart, so this was a pain to get out. Finally, we got a complete blade. No surprise, I see some metal shrinkage. And when I was banging this thing out, the tip hit the concrete and snapped off. Try to blend it in with some filing. But finally, we have a metal blade to work with. So I'll get it all cleaned up and take a closer look. It actually feels nice to hold right off the bat. I'll blend away all the extra metal from sprueing and then move on to sanding. With it cleaned up, you can really see the crystalline pattern of the metal, and that's from the metal shrinkage. I don't really want to see that, as cool as it is. I'll do my best to file that away so I can get a nice polish on that surface. But some of the crystal dimples run pretty deep, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to erase them all. It's amazing the detail the metal captures. The sanding even highlights the layer lines. The blade is already surprisingly sharp and somewhere along the way I got cut. It will cut. I use a small belt sander to help eliminate those crystal dimples where I can. Now it's time for some color contrast. I'm gonna try to darken it with some liver of sulfur, but it's not getting quite as dark as I'd like. Heating it up helps with the oxidation process, but in the end, I just put it in the kiln. I know that gives it a good oxidation layer. So now the blade is all dark and oxidized, and what I'm hoping I can do is buff all the high spots to a nice polished shine and have all the indents stay dark. Buffing wheel doesn't really take off the oxidation, so I'm gonna go back to sandpaper. So with a little more sanding and a little bit more buffing with a wire wheel, we're done. Took a while to get it, but you got it. Some of the pitting from the metal shrinkage is just too deep to really get rid of, but it just looks like it's been a little weathered out there in the desert. It is quite nice to wield. It's only one pound, seven ounces. It's surprisingly sharp. Well, it cut me anyway. Anyway, thanks for watching. Come on back for the next one. Bye-bye.